hello again. So I will now uh, discuss together with Paul uh, what we have been uh, doing uh, in uh, ECO. So the project started one and a half uh, years ago, and maybe I will more focus on the, the general context. Uh, so these first two slides, I think I will go fast. So Andrea already mentioned the European policy in details. So there are three pillars, infrastructure, technology, and application. Uh, so our project in, of course in the application pillar, and we are supposed to work in close collaboration with Stray, so providing the infrastructure and the technology pillar for the building and preparing the technology for the, for the next uh, generation of, uh, of hardware. Uh, so for the general context, ECHO is really, I would say, at the crossroad of two uh, major <laughs> resolutions. Uh, the first one is the uh, hardware and the exascale uh, revolution in, in HPC. So you have here a sketch of what could eventually be uh, an exascale uh, node. Uh, so you have, so this is a single node and so a large computer will be composed of several thousand of, of these. So you have uh, at the center here, uh, an inter interconnect for the, for the node. You could have in green uh, up there a dedicated high throughput engine, GPU or other thing, a serial engine, a very complex uh, memory hierarchy with high bandwidth uh, memory, low latency memory, uh, non volatile memory who could have a different use. And all these will be interconnected. You could have a dedicated node, uh, maybe for storage, more. Uh, not more dedicated to compute or to, to other things. So this could be an uh, extremely complex machine. Uh, just to look, if you look at present day computer, most of them, they have in one node, uh, one serial or two serial engine, standard CPU and standard memory. So basically all the rest is new and we have to learn on how to use these and how to master the use of such uh, complex uh, hardware. And this might even not be the proper picture because we don't really know what will be uh, future hyperscale technology. So that's for HPC. Now if we look at the energy domain. So energy domain, I would say this is a old fashioned energy. So this is a, a coal station uh, somewhere in Germany. I don't really know where that is. So it's a two gigawatt uh, power output and it uh, throws 80 megaton of CO2 every year. So obviously it's uh, not what we want to do, and it's one of the fifth largest emitter in Europe. So basically, this is going to stop in 2045 or hopefully earlier, and it's not the way we want to produce energy anymore. And so we had good news uh, two and a half months ago. So this is a power output in, uh, in Germany on uh, April 30, and you can see, so you have different energy resources. And at one point in the day, you had 85% of the total electricity produced in Germany, which was based on a renewable energy. And it's a mix of solar, uh, onshore and offshore wind, and uh, many different uh, resources. And you have uh, many examples. You can see here, that's for uh, Portugal, uh, the increase over the last 15 years of their production of renewables. So it was very low, and mainly it was uh, consisted of uh, of uh, hydropower, and now they have uh, increased a lot, especially with a uh, wind turbine, a bit solar, and anything, and it has grown almost by a factor 20 over uh, the last 15 years. And if you look uh, more globally, so this is a trend uh, for the world energy production, so total energy production, not just electricity, uh, up to 2050. Uh, so you have uh, <laughs> Uh, very many different sources of energy, and basically this part here, it's more than 30%, it's renewable energy, and with fossil energy going down. So what you can see is that renewable energy will have a considerable impact, and that it is very composite. So you have a wind, you have, a, and you can have many different ways of to getting energy from wind. You have solar energy, you have biomass, and you have uh, many things. And so for all these domains, you need a lot of simulation to predict uh, what will be the electricity production to manage the network, to find the new material uh, for uh, solar cells or for battery, for energy storage. And so for all these aspects, uh, really simulation is a, is a key issue. So ECHO is uh, really triggered in this context and is at the crossroad of these two revolutions. And the goal of ECHO is really to use the potential of this exascale architecture to really help and accelerate the, the energy transition. Uh, 
So I would say the main point of ECO, the first one is that hardware is going to change a lot. You would have uh, all this new architecture with the complex memory hierarchy, complex uh, uh, compute part also. And so it, uh, it will require to change the way code are built and application code are designed. Uh, then we are helping the energy transition. We're working on four uh, energy pillars. Maybe we need to work more. So material for energy, material for energy, water for energy, and fusion for energy. And then with this four pillars, we have a very strong transversal basis, who is making the connection between the HPC hardware and the energy application. Uh, so managing all the HPC applied mass and technological aspect of, uh, of the project. So just a quick presentation of the consortium. So ECO gather eight countries, 22 partners, and we have a bit more than 5 million in budget. Uh, it's a three-year project who started uh, in October 2015. So it will end in October, uh, in September 2018. And so there is a large, here you can see a Franco-German hub with uh, Julisch and CA uh, having a really a tricking map critical math, especially in an HPC application. And then a wide fiber open network with a strong partner in Italy and team in the UK, Spain, Poland, Cyprus, and Belgium. So gathering uh, really high-end expertise in a different uh, domain necessary for uh, our group. So you have here a map of ECO. We see in ECO in France, in Italy, Spain, everywhere, and Cyprus down there. So now the way the project is uh, structured. So uh, that is a picture of ECHO in its uh, global ecosystem. So ECHO is made of uh, the four vertical pillars. So meteo for energy, material for energy, water for energy, fusion for energy. So in each of these pillars, we have a, a critical match for each of the community, but of course not all the community. So all these four pillars are also responsible for disseminating our knowledge and good practice and what we do to a much wider community outside ECHO, so the, I would say the energy science community on the top left. Uh, and then these four pillars are very strongly interacting with the transversal basis. So this transversal basis gather uh, skills in applied math, linear algebra, numerical method, and HPC in general. And of course, we have uh, several uh, computing centers in, uh, in our project. And of course, we're also closely linked uh, at a wider scale to the HPC expert uh, community. Uh, you see on the graph that we have at the dots here, so it means that the way ECHO is structured, we could eventually add other pillars if we believe it's needed uh, in the global energy picture. And so ECHO, as was mentioned earlier, is inserted in the, in the global HPC framework. So we are closely related to the other pillar of the European HPC policy, so to PRESS. So we work uh, closely with PRESS uh, for training and for uh, using their infrastructure. So we are always testing and using uh, PRESS uh, infrastructure for uh, production. Uh, we are also closely related to the ETP for HPC. We are participating to the thinking around the, the ESB. We have been uh, contributing to the strategic research agenda that is produced by the ETP for HPC. And we're also working in close relation with uh, other COE uh, here at, uh, at the bottom. So especially with POP, we have organized a lot of workshops together with POP. Uh, so it's a performance uh, optimization and productivity uh, COE. With ECAM, who's dedicated to material science and easy ways to apply math, we worked a lot on I.O. Uh, together. And then uh, the uh, green bubble up there. So we're also related to the energy community at large, so with researchers try to develop a link with industry and SMEs, and we hope that today we can discuss this issue, which is uh, crucial, and with other uh, European uh, infrastructure. Uh, so one word about ECO is that ECO is really creating a, a new community that did not exist before. As you have seen, the renewable energy is a very wide topic, of, uh, a lot of ways to produce and to transport and to store renewable energy. And so we have been really building a new community around doing simulation for these energy problems that did not exist before. And uh, we think it's a, a great added value of the project to have gathered this, uh, this community. And of course, a lot of work is needed to integrate this community, to make the people work together, and to really uh, be uh, a big actor in the, 
in the global energy landscape. And so we have started on doing that, and we believe we have been successful, even if we need to, to work more on this. Uh, then, uh, so that I would say uh, a strategical goal. Then we have some uh, goal and objective uh, more on the technical level. So the transversal basis has objective uh, in uh, HPC issue. So it's to develop, optimize high-end tool and HPC software for the communities, and of course get them ready for exascale computer. Uh, so we are working there in applied math and numerical method, linear algebra, uh, system tool for HPC, and new programming model. And so Paul will present afterward the results in, uh, in this domain. So that's the technical objective of the project. Uh, and then we have some objectives more related to our <laughs> scientific pillar. So the scientific pillar are meant to improve the production, storage, and distribution of energy on different time scales, so short time scales, things are already ready to be implemented, midden and long term goal at the fusion, for example. So the methodology for energy package is concerned with very short uh, weather forecast to predict the production of solar and wind farm. So that's really necessary to do efficient coupling of uh, this mean of production to the grid and to do energy trading. Uh, in fusion for energy, uh, so the idea is to go toward the iter relevant uh, simulation and it's a key issue to master all the instability in the fusion process. So we are more concerned with the coupling kinetic and fluid code, which could be also an issue in uh, other domain, it's not only for fusion, and doing a mesh line with equilibrium configuration in the tokamak, so that's more specific to, to fusion. We are working also on material for energy. So material is really a key issue in the energy domain. And we are working especially on a photovoltaic cell, uh, inorganic photovoltaic cell, for example, uh, battery and a supercapacitor also. Uh, new material needs to be invented to increase the performance of uh, battery and supercapacitor. And lastly, the water for energy package. So there we care about the geothermal and hydropower, the management of these resources, the strategy of usage, and how they could be influenced by uh, climate change. Uh, so what we have been doing, our exascale approach, is we have tried to develop a systematic approach for code monitoring and performance analysis. So first of all, we had to we had a lot of application in ECO related to the different scientific fields. So we need a, a deep technical knowledge of these applications to be able to, to work on them. So we have done a detailed performance metric concerning the way the application computes, the way it access memory, I.O., communication, many things. And then we have developed uh, this metric sheet and the associated tool to evaluate cause in this systematic way. This has been fully automated. Uh, so it's important that it's automated because it allows uh, people who are not very familiar with optimization tools uh, to really uh, do this performance evaluation in an easy and seamless way. And it will also to have a code diary to follow up the evolution of the performance when you, you work on the code. So the main goal uh, of this was to make the community performance aware. Many people, even some who develop uh, a lot, are deeply involved in code development are not really performance aware. And then to establish a key roadmap for optimization of all the applications we have. Then to monitor the progress and start in any time the make bottleneck and what we need to be refactored for porting these applications to, to exascale architecture. And so, thanks to our project structure, the work on the application has been done with close collaboration between people of Work Package 1, so it's the Work Package which gather, I would say, HPC experts, and Work Package 2 to 5, so this one gather application experts, and so they have been working together on the application and have obtained very good results on a production application. So you see here a, a bunch, each line is an application. The vertical axis is basically the single core performance, and horizontal axis is the scalability. And you see that we have a very high-end code ready for exascale and that we're trying to push to the extreme scale demonstrator. And some codes which are, I would say, less advanced in, in HPC, but which are still uh, physically very relevant and that we try to push as far as possible. And so Paul will uh, discuss uh, these results, but you can see that we have obtained really good results of many kinds of score. And the idea is really to turn exascale into benefit with pushing uh, I would say the most scalable application toward exascale 
and try to bring the skill gap and have the other user uh, also uh, getting benefit from these uh, new technologies. Uh, we have also been working a lot on making the community SPC aware. Uh, so we have organized a lot of workshops, uh, many with the pop COE, uh, tutorial, which are available on our website for different programming techniques of different issues for SPC, a lot of face-to-face -face meeting with discussion, and uh, there's a lot of, uh, I would say, daily work between SPC experts and application experts who develop uh, the code. So the thematic pillar, uh, what do they do in ECO? So they are ensuring that the COE are user driven, so really try to meet the user needs and to, to develop tools that could address the scientific uh, challenge. Uh, each of them have a clear scientific case and that uh, most of the time require HPC or exascale computing. So we have both a technical challenge for exascale associated to a scientific challenge. Uh, as I mentioned, all pillars are strong links and are co-working with WP1, so the SPC expert, to develop this application. And in each work package, we have a flagship code what, that really has a high scalability and uh, an associated related scientific challenge that we will try to push to exascale. And then tools which are, I would say, uh, less scalable, but nevertheless relevant for the scientific community. And so in all this uh, work, uh, thematic pillar, we had very significant achievement enabled thanks to HPC tool. So we have uh, results uh, in material science for new material for photovoltaic cells and battery, uh, for uh, weather forecasting, short-term weather forecasting using a probabilistic approach for a reverse discharge of very high resolution or for a uh, say high large scale simulation which uh, start to look uh, like ITER, like what is needed for ITER from a physical and geometrical uh, point of view. So it's, uh, I would say, the big picture uh, of ECO. Uh, Paul will give more details on the work we have done. I just want now to, one word about the, I would say, the goal of the day. I'm saying that now because it's good that you hear the next talk uh, with uh, this in mind. So the idea, what we're trying to do with ECO is to build a European hub where well, HPC and energy community can meet and where Exascale could be used to help the energy transition. And so that's some of the questions that will be discussed at the round table, but that you can start thinking of. It, what are the needs in terms of HPC related computational expertise in the energy domain? So now and in the future, so how can HPC help the energy transition? Where is it most useful? Uh, what are the use case of HPC application and potential industrial impact? And also, uh, what in this would require exascale? So is exascale useful for the energy transition and what can exascale bring in terms of computation? Also exascale is not only about flux, but there's a big issue about data and storage. So how could it be useful uh, in terms of uh, energy transition? Thank you, so we will stop here. Uh, yeah, so I should introduce myself. My name is Paul Gibbon. I'm from the Ulich node of uh, ECHO. Uh, where we're actually involved in uh, every uh, every work package. So in each of these pillars, we have we have a group uh, working. So this is why Ulich is very interested in this in this project. Uh, I myself, I'm based at the uh, Supercomputing Center, so I'm I'm more kind of uh, in this uh, horizontal uh, activity. <coughs> so um, let me just uh, return to this theme um, about how we, how we work in ECHO. So as Edouard already uh, explained, we have, we have these four uh, thematic uh, domains. Uh, and we also have this, this horizontal HPC uh, basis. And rather than let, now you could say, okay, we divide this up into five work packages and let everybody go away and, and, and do some work and then uh, come together for, for our meetings. But um, we realize this, this won't work in terms of um, uh, interaction or improving code. So what, we, what we've done is we've insisted that uh, each of the applications in, in these uh, vertical domains um, has some uh, 
well, get, get some challenge defined <coughs> for it. Okay, so we asked the PIs in here to define some energy science challenge for which the application doesn't quite fit the bill yet. Okay, and that uh, so that they they have to come to us in order to get it uh, up to speed, and then they can uh, go ahead and solve their their challenge. And one of these, uh, I'll give you an example straight away. This comes from the uh, meteorology uh, domain. Uh, this is about uh, short-term uh, or immediate-term now casting. Um, and it's really uh, about doing probabilistic uh, forecasting for solar and wind power. So you can imagine this is a, this is a very sensitive thing. If you, get the, if you get the amount of sunlight wrong on a you know, above a solar farm or the wind uh, speed wrong in a certain region where you're, you want to be generating power, this can of course affect the, uh, the, the production through these energy sources uh, on, on the following day or a couple of days and this will affect the energy market itself. So it actually, there, there is actually a stock exchange for energy and, and, and the pricing of this uh, uh, market is very sensitive to uh, to weather, okay, and so this is the, the, the kind of thing that um, we're trying to do here. This is actually the work of uh, Hendrik Elburn, who's uh, also here today, I think. Yes. Is he? Yes. <laughs> okay. So if I say anything wrong, then Hendrik will correct me immediately. But um, so this is this is a, a, an application which, which actually uses this uh, uh, rather uh, standard public uh, model, the the Wharf model. Uh, which is uh, uh, publicly accessible, but this alone is not enough. They have to do uh, many, many runs with this with this code, up to a thousand uh, simulations, the so-called ensemble, and it's really the, the processing of that uh, collective ensemble which is the key here. And that's something which they've optimized uh, during the course of the project. Um, okay, in the... Uh, the second pillar here, this is um, uh, quite a broad uh, range of activity. There are actually four uh, separate uh, lines here, so-called application lines. Um, the lead here is Massimo Cilino, who's uh, also sitting here. And again, <coughs> he can correct me if I <laughs> say something wrong. So really, uh, they've actually got a similar uh, matrix in miniature uh, to our uh, global uh, project matrix. So we have the, the kind of vertical uh, applications here and then horizontally we have the uh, numerical tools uh, used to uh, tackle these challenges. But you see that they can actually, uh, you know, each, each model uh, can be utilized in each of these um, applications. Okay, and I'll, I think I'll come to, I have one example a little bit further along where, which illustrates this in more detail. Um, the, the third one is, is uh, hydrology. Again, Edouard already mentioned this, and there, there are two main um, uh, applications here. One is on geothermal uh, power, and the other on um, hydropower, management of hydropower, and predicting <coughs> um, how much water you're going to get um, you know, flowing into your, into your dams. And this really requires extremely detailed, high-resolution uh, modeling of the entire, um, you know, on a, on a continental scale, uh, more or less here. So that's, that's the goal there. And then finally, um, <clears throat> we have a, a, a fusion energy uh, pillar uh, here. Um, we, as as we, I think many of you probably uh, know, this is, uh, there is a, a, a device being uh, commissioned in, at the moment in Cadarache, the ITER uh, device, uh, which uh, will, once it's uh, finished, hopefully produce the order of uh, half a gigawatt um, of power with, uh, with a genuine fusion gain. So this is the, it's, it's, it's more than just a scientific goal here, it's really to, to kind of, uh, to act as a proof of principle. But there are enormous challenges in, in getting there uh, not least in understanding how the how the, uh, the fuel can be burned efficiently and how it can be extracted, and that's that's really the challenge here for the, the models, which um, 
at the moment cannot uh, deal with a device of this scale uh, on, on the present uh, supercomputing uh, infrastructure. Okay, so this really is a, a genuine uh, exascale driver here. Okay, so let me just come back uh, to our uh, horizontal HPC um, activities, uh, which uh, is kind of the, the bulk of the, the project, I would say. It's one which, um, which everybody interacts with, and uh, where we have a, a range of uh, tools and uh, services and activities. Um, here, it's, it's illustrated in terms of um, perhaps where you would, uh, the order you would uh, come to us, or the order of uh, difficulty uh, or intensity you might uh, require help with. Okay. So the very first thing is, is uh, perhaps come to us with a code which doesn't scale, and we'll look at it, uh, we'll, we'll analyze it, and then give advice on, on uh, how to improve it. Okay. And then... As, as you come down here, you get uh, you get some more more sophisticated uh, uh, labor intensive um, improvements uh, in, in the, the uh, numerical algorithm itself. <coughs> so, uh, but the point is that we we're really offering um, a wide spectrum of skills in order to improve or continuously improve your your applications uh, up to exascale. I mean, I'll, I'll, uh, Come to that in in a moment. Um, the way we introduce people to our our services is primarily through uh, um, hands-on workshops, and we've held uh, three of these so far. We've got another one coming up uh, in uh, November, I believe. Um, and these are really um, these are almost one-to-one. -one, okay, we've had uh, so far we've had. Um, uh, 67 participants here. Um, about half of those have been uh, actual code developers. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> within the workshop, we might have 20 people. 10 of those will be will be tutored. So you really do get uh, over the three days, you get uh, very very intensive uh, training, and then that's that's. But it doesn't stop there. You see, we what we do is uh, we insist that at least during the workshop. Uh, we create a, a kind of little co-team from the developers and and from our horizontal HPC uh, team, and and then they will go away, uh, go back and then um, analyze uh, further, uh, complete the analysis, write a report, and then try and identify where they need to uh, invest work, invest effort, in order to um, improve their application further. Okay. Now it might turn out that. Uh, you know, there's no quick fix, and if that's the case, then you know we, we have the option of, of passing work along to to our uh, experts in um, linear algebra drivers, for example. Okay. So we have a kind of um, uh, workflow uh, established uh, to help people um, at various levels. Okay, I think I'll I'll just skip that one. I just want to show. Um, that we have a quite systematic way of um, assessing and monitoring applications. You see here the, the applications we've covered so far. There are 21 different codes from all of these um, energy domains. And then along the top here, we've got uh, um, really a, a comprehensive set of uh, performance analysis tools which we use to um, Really, to to uh, to assess, to, to quantitatively assess, and uh, and then identify um, bottlenecks in the application. Okay, so I I just come back to uh, this chart, which you've already seen. This has uh, already generated quite a lot of discussion. I I just dwell on uh, one or two bits here. So this is this is really a you can sort of see if you remember the you won't remember the names, but this is basically a, a subset of the slide I had. Uh, before, this is uh, you know, 11, 12 applications out of the, the, the 21 we've, we've actually looked at so far. So you can expect this chart to, to get fuller over the, the coming months as, as uh, you know, these, these uh, improvements uh, start to come in. But I just want to point out that you know, we, we do talk about exascale candidates, and as well already pointed out, we've got you know, four or five 
uh, here uh, ready to go. Uh, we can't go any further here. So this is the, the current scalability in terms of tasks. So you can call it cores or threads, uh, whatever you want. Uh, this is a kind of generic, uh, sort of generalized uh, axis here. So this is this is the Ukraine machine in, in, in Ulich. Uh, it can currently do up to uh, nearly two million threads. Okay, two million tasks. Um, this is the Gisela um, gyrokinetic fusion code, uh, which has already achieved this this benchmark, and it, it cannot go any further. Okay, in Europe we can't we can't push it any further at the moment. So we're we're waiting here for you know a bigger machine in order to. Of course, we can we can optimize at other levels, which we've done here. Okay, we've, we've fiddled with uh, uh, tuning and, and libraries and so on. Uh, so we can we can optimize in, in this sense, but we can't scale it any further. Now. At the other uh, extreme of the spectrum, uh, you see that we ten to the zero. That's one. Okay, the, this these codes here, these three codes, came to us. Uh, they were they were running on a laptop, okay, and but they had problems which where they needed more. They needed to uh, to improve dramatically in order to get. And this is uh, and that, that's what we, we managed to. So we already got a factor of ten speed up just by some fairly fairly easy uh, parallelization. Uh, so these are what we call low hanging fruits, okay. Um, so we can pick those off and okay, we get some nice. Uh, Know, uh, transformation or <laughs> improvement out of that, but that it doesn't stop there. Um, an exa a good example is this this one here. This PV negative. This is used for uh, photovoltaic uh, simulations. Uh, it's really a kind of um, it's it's, um, it's a DFT. So it's a density dens function. It does it does atomistic um, uh, computation of photovoltaic. So it computes <coughs> the efficiency of the the PV material, and in this case, uh, this, this is a nice case where we've we've really um, kind of instilled or triggered ambition in the developers. You see, they first thought, "Oh, we don't know if we're going to get any improvement. We'll come on to the workshop anyway. We'll see what happens." And then, okay, they already got this this factor ten, but now we've uh, the the uh, the PI here uh, was Eberhardt, who's, who's also in, happens to be in Munich in one of the energy uh, institutes <coughs> there. So he has, uh, he put a, a, a new PhD student onto it. He said, okay, well, let's just try a simplified, a more, a more simpler uh, version of the model. And actually they've, they've got this kind of reduced physics model to, to scale from here up to here, okay? So they've gone, you know, they've kind of created a, a miniature version of the model and and shown that it can it can actually uh, get here. So this is an example where okay they, they haven't uh, they haven't uh, been able to, to um, improve the entire model, but but a, a, a core a key uh, part of it. And so it just shows what what the potential is there. Even for for beginners, for HPC beginners, we can uh, you know span this. Uh, this gap here, and so this is this is one of the things we we set out to do. This is uh, you know so-called skill gap bridging, and in this case, uh, I think we've we've managed that quite nicely. Okay, I'm probably uh, running out of time, so I'm I'm going to perhaps uh, skip through some of these. This is this is uh, again this is the example of the the ensemble uh, meteorology uh, computation here, where we've also got a, a nice uh, speed up, and also demonstrated that it could. Uh, if you can define a suitable problem, it could uh, also be an exascale candidate. <coughs> uh, Supercapacitors is another example where you've already got a, a nice uh, speed up. And again, if you if you think about larger problems, you can you could also uh, go a lot a lot further. Supercapacitors, by the way, these are the things that you need in in electric vehicles to uh, to recover the the, the energy that you that you're committing. It's a, it's a special type of uh, storage unit. Okay, so let me just um, summarize what we are uh, trying to do here. This is a sort of even more generic representation of our, of our chart. So um, 
the, the, the traditional way to tackle uh, exascale, you see on this scale here, we've got, we've got a, a transition here from petascale, this is where we are now, to exascale. We don't quite know what's going to, you know, what this is going to look like, but we know that it's going to be difficult uh, and more complex. And the traditional way to do it is to, uh, is to first of all, strip down your, your application so you just have a kind of kernel routine with a few, few hundred lines maybe. And that you can you can work on, you can play with like a sandbox, and you don't have to worry too much about uh, whether it's uh, useful or not. Okay. And the problem for us is that we are building a, a new community, as as well as already said, and that uh, we'd like to keep these uh, developers on board, keep them interested, keep them keen, and so we've we've opted for a more kind of um, incremental path so far. Uh, it could be that at this point we're going to have to do something more dramatic um, and, and perhaps also you know, follow this, this route to some extent. But we also want to feed, feed back these improvements into the, uh, into the production. Okay? We want to make it immediately uh, useful. <clears throat> okay, and then there are, um, I think, um, We've heard this also before in the two previous talks. The, there will be an extreme scale demonstrator prototype coming in 2020-2021. Um, and we've been asked to provide input to that uh, from our uh, energy uh, application, rather our, our exascale candidate applications. And there are four of those. Um, I perhaps won't go into too much detail. I mean, this is, these are really the metrology and, and water uh, cases, which I've uh, sketched before, and you can do the same for uh, materials, um, storage, uh, supercapacitors, and so on. And, and the, the fusion for energy, this is a nice one, uh, because there are numbers here already. What I would like, actually, for the other three that I've just mentioned, uh, if uh, you know, we can have some discussion, we need uh, hard <coughs> numbers here as well uh, to provide input to this case. Okay. This is imminent. This is, going to, this is going to go into a white paper or you know, discussion paper um, for, the, for the ESD um, uh, call. So, um, so in this case, you can kind of see that if you scale things up to the, the, the ETA machine, uh, currently simulations are, are using uh, several hundred million core hours, and so if you uh, if you want to do the same calculation with in more detail at larger scale, then you've already got you know two or three orders of magnitude on top of that. So you're talking about billions of, of core hours. Really. Okay. Finally, um, or and ultimately, <laughs> I would just like to point out that we uh, we do have a. Uh, Fairly substantial service offer. You can look us up here under the service page. Uh, external. Uh, sorry, if you're external, you're welcome to to uh, send us a query if you've got a, a burning problem. You'd like to uh, improve an application. Uh, just just send us a uh, send us a call. And um, <clears throat> again, just I just want to recap on our perspectives. Leave this. Uh, uh, as a discussion, uh, we've already heard we've, we've got a kind of conjunction of two two major paradigm shifts, and uh, we've kind of I mean, this happened kind of at the time we were preparing the uh, the, the, the the proposal uh, three years ago. I think it is now. I started talking about it, so it's a it's a happy coincidence, and uh, we hope to consolidate on that now and really really start uh, uh, pushing uh, energy stage stakeholders into, into HPC or trying to try and bring them together, discuss uh, how we can uh, work together more closely. 